Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us for this uh, live event at TVO.org. Uh, my name is Dan Dunsky. I'm the executive producer of The Agenda with Steve Pakin, and I'm happy to be here with you this afternoon for our, LERS, our, LERS, our first live chat on international affairs uh, with our TVO's very own foreign affairs observer, analyst Janice Stein. Say hello, Janice. Hello, Dan. Very glad to be with you. Thanks, Janice. It's really good to have you, too. Uh, Janice and I have worked together for a great many years here at TVO, and uh, I've come to know her, and I think a lot of our viewers have come to know her as a first-rate analyst of international events. And uh, what we're doing today is we've been asking you in advance and during this, uh, during this session to send us any questions you have about uh, international affairs, and we'll put them to Janice and have a bit of a conversation. Daniel Kitts is moderating. Uh, so he'll be sending me questions and I'll be putting them to you. And uh, Janice, I guess uh, just before I line up the first question, which I see has already come in, I'll just ask you, what are you keeping your eyes on? What is keeping you um, up, if you will, uh, around the globe right now? Well, certainly I'm riveted uh, on the U.S. election. A uh, stunning surprise, really, that it has become as close as it is, uh, even a week ago. Uh, Obama had such a commanding lead in the polls in Ohio, in Florida, and other swing states that many of us thought it was done. Uh, we were wrong. It is. Uh, it looks like it's close now. Uh, the next debate is this evening, and clearly, who becomes president of the United States is going to matter on a lot of foreign policy issues. So that's one big one. A second really interesting issue. It's a little below the radar. The Egyptian government is now negotiating a new loan with the IMF. It is a whopper of a loan, the biggest loan that uh, Egypt has ever asked for. But it is critical because the Egyptian economy is in free fall. Joblessness is up since the revolution. Foreign currency reserves are down. And Egypt is a very important player in the new Middle East that is evolving. Janice, just on that question, do you anticipate that um, that the special relationship that the United States has had with Israel since the mid 19 uh, excuse me with Egypt since the late 1970s, do you expect that that could change not only given uh, the election results in Egypt, but if there were a Romney presidency uh, instead of an Obama presidency? I think that the relationship between the United States and Egypt would be easier under Obama than it would be under Romney. Uh, I think Obama has more of a feel. Uh, he played a very interesting role in the Arab Spring. Certainly in Egypt, he came out very early and very strong. And there's good memories uh, in Egypt about that. Uh, so it will be, it, uh, certainly the, the whole tone, the personal relationships will be a lot easier if it's Obama. Uh, Egypt is trying to find its own voice now. Um, there, there's a, this is not an easy call for many uh, in the Brotherhood because there is a sense of realism. They have to get this loan from the IMF. Uh, they need U.S. support for that. They want the um, assistance to continue from the United States, but they do not want to be seen as Mubarak was, as a puppet of the United States. They need to find ways which are authentic to them to express who they are. They want renewed leadership uh, in the Arab world. Uh, they want to reclaim their traditional position. So yes, under Obama, I think the special relationship will continue, but it's not going to be the same special relationship that existed with Mubarak. Under Romney, hard to know um, because often what presidential candidates say is not actually what they do. Uh, but it certainly we're hearing a much tougher line coming out of the Romney campaign. Okay, uh, thanks for getting us started, Janice. I'm going to just avert my gaze here and read our first question, uh, which comes from uh, Dennis C. Uh, Janice, he asks when, actually he says, Dear Janice, when Canadian and NATO troops leave Afghanistan, do you expect that country to revert to the way it was when the Taliban were in control? Or do you expect many years of political instability due to uh, the power of warlords, increased arms, etc.? What is your assessment of what will happen um, uh, once uh, the Western powers do quit Afghanistan? That's a great question. Um, and I wish I had uh, a definitive answer. 
uh, to give you, there was a really pessimistic report that just came out of the International Crisis Group two days ago, uh, which predicted a return of Taliban control as soon as the United States leaves in 2014. Boy, that's a gloomy prognosis. Uh, probably a little too gloomy, uh, but maybe not gloomy enough. Probably a little too gloomy because the United States is actually not leaving entirely in 2014. They're going to leave troops behind on the ground. There are ongoing negotiations between the Karzai government and the U.S. administration about the responsibilities and rights of these soldiers. So 2014 is not the kind of black and white deadline that many people think. Probably not gloomy enough, though, because the Taliban came to power in Afghanistan after years of bloody, bloody civil war, which broke out among uh, different leaders in different parts of the country. Many of them were armed with militias. That's a lot what Afghanistan looks like today, unfortunately. You know, we, we claim in the West that we the single biggest accomplishment is we've trained an army, 350,000 people. The Afghan army loses a third of its members every year. They desert and walk and go home. And they have to be re-recruited. New people have to be recruited. Tremendous amount of arms have been distributed to so-called police forces, which are really militias, and it's an entirely believable scenario that a civil war will erupt again. Uh, those in the north are not going to sit by quietly and welcome a resurgent Taliban force coming out of the south. So in some sense, the International Crisis Group, I don't think, paid enough attention to the likelihood of a civil war. What we're not going to get is a peaceful, stable, democratic Afghanistan. With I, I understand what you're saying, and I'll, I'll follow up by asking you, uh, is, it, is, it, is the best that we can hope for, Janice, uh, and, and as Canadians who were there for a decade, is the best that we can hope for to have some kind of Western pro, uh, presence and enough Afghan troops trained that some of the large, that Kabul and other large cities remain uh, somewhat um, out of the hands uh, or, or, or remain somewhat settled and that if there is a civil war that uh, does uh, that does come back to Afghanistan that the cities remain kind of effectively in effect garrisoned from it is that the best we can hope for there's one more fact we have to throw into all of this done and that is that there are presidential elections coming up in Afghanistan in 2014 and that President Karzai cannot run again there is a constitutional prohibition against more than two terms. So some of what we're seeing in Afghanistan is Karzai maneuvering to get his people in place to run for that election. So who the next president of Afghanistan is will matter. Um, you know, holding the cities, the yeah. bigger picture, holding the cities, that's a short-term solution as we know because if you lose control of the countryside, you have cities that are isolated, especially in a country like Afghanistan, uh, where the rural sector is so huge, uh, where the roads between the cities are not secure. Uh, you don't really hold the cities for very long. That was the Russian strategy, right. hold the cities. Um, it, it, it's a temporary breather, but it, it's not something that can endure for a decade with any success. And I suppose there, we'll, we'll move on to a question from Ash in just a second, but I suppose that we can all agree that the United States uh, would not repeat the mistake of leaving Stinger missiles behind. I don't think the United States will leave Stinger missiles behind, but on the other hand, it's armed the Afghan army. So just think about this. Um, you're having a one-third desertion rate in the Afghan army, and many of them leave with their personal weapons, plus whatever else they can pilfer. Um, from what, the kind of, what kind of arms are you talking about? Just machine guns and rifles? There's rifles, there's machine guns, but also they know where the more advanced weaponry is stored, right? Now, they're secured right now by, by U.S. forces. Uh, when they leave, it's difficult to imagine um, that the security around, uh, you know, the depositories is going to be anything like what it is now. So I think, again, 
it's easy to imagine a scenario where some of that stuff leaks to people who are opposed to whatever government emerges from this election. It's, it's, it's actually not a great confluence of circumstances to have a presidential election and a significant withdrawal of foreign forces all within relatively the same time period. I guess, uh, Janice, I'll move on to the next question, but I guess that it, it just proves the, the adage that uh, in, in uh, international affairs, sometimes you're not faced with good situations, uh, just the, your choice has to be the least of the bad, bad options. You know, absolutely. I mean, just to flip over uh, and, and think about Syria for a minute, which in some sense is the opposite, right? People are saying, why aren't we doing anything? Why aren't we doing anything? Why don't we have boots on the ground? Um, it's, it's quite interesting how quickly the public forgets uh, the costs and the casualties of having boots on the ground uh, in Afghanistan, remembers only Libya, which it seems to be a success in comparison. In Syria, very similar situation. There are no good choices, really. Doing nothing, um, you can argue, is empowering more radical forces who are actually getting uh, anti-aircraft missiles uh, from Qatar, from Saudi Arabia, and those are, they're not being distributed equally across the opposition fighters. They're going to the more militant fighters. Uh, doing something, boy, uh, after the Afghan experience, you really have to ask, uh, can the West ever succeed again in putting boots on the ground uh, outside its own broad confines? I really doubt it. Keeping it in the same part of the world, Janice, uh, we have a question from Ash, and his question concerns Iran, and he is wondering if an Iran with nuclear weapons um, is uh, the existential threat that politicians of all stripes seem to be saying it is. Well, let me first, let me answer that question by trying to explain why people think it is. Um, and I think there's, the reason it's an existential, some people think it's an existential threat is because of the rhetoric of the Iranian government. It's not simply the possession of nuclear weapons. You know, Britain has nuclear weapons, France has nuclear weapons. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, India has nuclear weapons. Uh, but none of these governments routinely use the rhetoric. And this is the Secretary General who made this point, in which they threaten to destroy another state, uh, to wipe it off the face of the earth. Uh, so what is so concerning about Iran is the, qual the repeated quality of the rhetoric that comes out of this government, which actually leads people in governments to ask the question, are these people so-called rational? Um, will they calculate the damages that will come to their government if they use nuclear weapons? And that's an unanswerable question. Now, we can look back at Iranian behavior ever since 1979, and in fact, it's been very conservative. It really has not once attacked a neighboring state in all out war. It was attacked by Iraq. So the track record of behavior, much more encouraging than the rhetoric, but it's that incendiary combination of rhetoric and a nuclear weapon that has governments all over the world, you know, China worries about this, Russia, France, Germany, the United States. Uh, this is a widely shared worry. So you're, you're saying that Iran, since 1979, the Iranian leadership has acted rationally vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors. Yes. Is that also the case with regards to actions that it's taken outside of the immediate neighborhood, so support for, its, uh, support for militia groups, support for proxy armies elsewhere? It's been active not only in the Middle East, but also, um, well, mostly in the Middle East, but arguably in Latin America as well. And ha has it always shown itself to be rational? In other words, it, it is, it, it, you, can, you can paint a picture of how Iran's actions make sense given the context that they're operating in. I, I think that's the second dimension of real worry, but th those are not existential threats, which was the first question. So Iran has supported Hezbollah actively in, in Lebanon. Uh, Shias, uh, it, it supported Hamas, which are not Shia, they're Sunni. Uh, so it has a history of doing that. And one of the worries, not existential, but one of the worries, once it has a nuclear weapon, it will feel freer to do that with impunity. 
because it will feel that it can deter an attack against itself, so it will encourage those militias that it supports to act more vigorously. There's also a record of supporting uh, terror attacks against civilians uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, and that too is worrying. As a nuclear power, will it do more of that? It's a conceivable argument that it would, because it would be more confident that nobody would dare to attack um, the regime as it now stands. You know, Iranians, the Iranian leadership, look at what happened to Saddam. They look at what happened to Gaddafi. Um, Gaddafi gave up nuclear weapons. It's a very compelling argument in Tehran that if Gaddafi had not given up those weapons, he would still be in power. So, one, I'm pretty pessimistic that the Iranians will actually uh, change trajectories and renounce nuclear weapons. I think they'll continue to do what they do, stopping just short of fully developing a nuclear weapon, partly out of defensive reasons and partly because I think it will give them leverage in negotiations. So Iran would stop and just be a, a turnkey nuclear power. And, and, and I suppose we should just clarify, you said they would stop short of developing. Uh, Iran has been very clear that it is that it is uh, solely seeking a peaceful uh, nuclear uh, energy program. Uh, just the last word on this before I move to the next question, which is still related. Uh, is that claim met with much credibility in the international community? Well, there's, there's, you know, there's contradictory evidence. So in the last month, uh, Iran has been visibly leaving tracks that it has taken the uranium that is enriched to 20% and use that uranium uh, to manufacture medical isotopes. Now, that is fully consistent with an Iranian claim that their program is for peaceful purposes. There are other parts of their program, however, uh, which, are, which the IAEA, the International uh, Atomic Energy Inspectors, have said are not consistent at all with a peaceful program. Buying triggers, uh, which you would only do if you actually want to make a weapon. Uh, you know, difficulties gaining access to, to suspected sites in real time. There is a history here, one, which the IAEA confirms, of uh, deception of international inspectors, of purchases which are only consistent with a path toward a military program, not a peaceful program. So we've got conflicting evidence and we have no smoking gun. Janice, uh, Victor asks, and keeping it on this issue, would it actually be in Israel's best interest for Iran to have more power in the region? And he goes on to say, be it nuclear weapons or a friendly regime in Syria, such a situation could cause tension in the Middle East from the conflicting Sunni and Shiite spheres of influence, allowing Israel some breathing room and a chance to ally or, uh, uh, well, to ally against Sy the axis of Syria and Iran. Um, I think that, to the, well, you may understand the question, but it's a, it's a kind of a divide and conquer question. Is there some, is this ultimately in Israel's interest given the, the, the animosity that exists between Iran and the Sunni states? Well, it's actually interesting because history helps us answer that one because for the last really 30 years we've had a de facto alliance between Iran and Syria, as our questioner suggests. It's been an alliance between uh, a Shia government in Iran and the Alawite government in Syria, which is a government that was really not acceptable to many of the Sunni Arab states. And the way it's been, it's been a fairly close alliance, and it's enabled Iran to transship arms and equipment through Syria to Hezbollah to the Shia community in Lebanon. Um, it's not clear whether that brought uh, much breathing room for anybody uh, because Israel and Hezbollah have been involved uh, several times in all-out border wars between the two of them. The counter-argument to that, um, and this is what is making the Iranians so anxious, is that out of this war will come a Sunni government that will have no patience, no truck, uh, with the Alawites who fought back so fiercely. And the longer this war goes on, 
uh, the more damage is done to the process of any kind of moderate government coming out of it. Uh, Iran will lose its access to Hezbollah. It will find it much tougher to ship weapons to Hezbollah. Uh, it will be tough for it to support Hamas. Uh, so that that you know the ability to support militias, which we talked about earlier, done right. is much much harder should the current regime in Syria fall. So you're actually seeing the Iranians begin, they're, they're I think becoming more and more concerned that the Assad regime will not survive and they're beginning to position themselves to establish relationships with a successor regime. They may try to do that, it's not going to be as close as what they've had with the al-Assad family for sure. Now that you've taken us to Syria, our, our next question from Rene uh, is, is about this, but let me just ask you first, is there any question in your mind that the Syrian conflict has in effect or in part become a proxy war between Sunni and Shia powers in the region? There's, it's, I, I fundamentally agree um, with that proposition. There is a very large Sunni-Shia element uh, to this conflict. Uh, outside of Iran, um, it's only the, the Al-Assad family, frankly the Alawites, whom by the way the Shia do not accept as Shia, right. but whom the Sunni do not accept as Sunni. Uh, but if you ask Sunni what the Alawites are, they'll tell you Shia. So they're accepted by nobody, uh, but the Sunnis clearly see them as closer to the Shia than they are to the Sunnis. Um, but that axis, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, which are Shia in southern Lebanon, uh, versus uh, Jordan, um, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, those who are at the forefront of the struggle. Interest, you know, the really interesting role is the government of Iraq, which is a Shia government, but trying to insulate itself against a war that could spill over its borders and destabilize itself. But that fault line of Sunni Shia division is running through this whole region now, I think in a much sharper and more acute way than it did even 10 years ago. Rene asks, the Syria situation is very upsetting. Why the total lack of interest? Could countries other than Russia and China not prevent weapons from entering that country. So following up on what we're saying, it is clear that weapons are being uh, smuggled into the country, both on the, along the Shia axis, primarily from Iran, and, and the Sunni axis, primarily being funded by the Gulf states and by Saudi Arabia. Is there anything else that, or is there anything, frankly, that could be done, that should be done, Rene is asking, to prevent the fl inflow of weapons uh, into Syria, which is is uh, is making this so much more a deadly conflict. It's a, it's a really, really difficult situation. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese, not so much the Chinese, frankly, but the Russians are clearly um, facilitating, enabling the shipment of weapons. You know, the Russians will tell you not so, that they're only honoring contracts that they've long had, but it's clear there is a pipeline coming from Russia. But on the other side, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are also shipping weapons to, to the Sunni fighters who are resisting. And there's a range of fighters, hard to know, you know, unless you're on the ground exactly what the balance of power is, but there is a more militant Islamist um, end uh, of the spectrum among the Sunni fighters, and they're getting the lion's share of the military equipment. So it's, the arms are flowing to both sides in this conflict. How do you, you know, is, what, what, what does a, a country like the United States or Canada, Britain, and France do? Do they blockade the coast of Syria? That would be, in many sense, an act of war against Russian ships that have every right to land uh, at the port in which they have a facility. The Saudis and the Qataris ship the equipment over land. No easy way to limit the weapons that are flowing in. And in fact, what we're seeing now is pressure on the US, Britain, Germany to step up uh, the flow of equipment so that the more moderate Sunni fighters, because what they're hearing back is, hey, hey, look, uh, what you're doing is empowering more militant elements because we're not getting the kind of equipment we need to fight, and if you don't want that outcome after the war is over, send more now. And that, that I can sense that pressure beginning to mount. 
do you do you support such an action, Janice? Would you be in favor of further arming the opposition to the Assad regime? On balance, yes. Uh, and the reason being that as this drags on, this can drag on for years, frankly, and the cost to civilians will be huge. We are getting hundreds and hundreds of killed every month. The longer it goes, the larger the number of civilian casualties we're, we'll get. Uh, there is an argument to be made now since I, it's, it's almost the argument of irreconcilable differences. There's no credible possibility that any mediator can get the Assad government either to cease fire or to engage in any kind of political negotiations with the opposition. Once you come to that judgment, your objective is to end this. Uh, sooner rather than later. The only way you're going to end this is if you actually arm the opposition. So that is a that is a step up for sure, but it's a step far short of committing either Western air power or even worse than that, from my perspective, Western boots on the ground. Uh, well, as you said, uh, the, the the civilian situation is getting worse. Uh, the the latest estimates are thirty thousand dead in Syria and. Uh, close to 800,000 refugees, uh, 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 according to figures that I just saw this morning. You know, when, uh, when Barack Obama uh, agreed to participate and when he led from behind, or the United States led from behind in Libya, the justification that he gave was that um, it was intolerable to sit around and wait for a massacre to happen. Uh, in other words, there was a humanitarian, a strong humanitarian dimension to um, the United States and NATO involvement in Libya. Now, obviously, for reasons of realpolitik, they're not doing that here. But my question to you is: uh, Does it? Should we be careful about using the language of uh, of humanitarianism as a rationale for um, getting involved in certain conflicts? Because then you do have the ch you are very open to the hip to the charge of being hip hypocritical, as right now is happening with the United States and Syria. I agree completely. Only more. Uh, I think it was a huge mistake to use the language of the responsibility to protect in Libya. Responsibility to protect R2P, as Canadians know it, is a doctrine that we actually led in developing, and you summarized it accurately done in a sentence, that we have an obligation to intervene to prevent imminent atrocities against civilians. You could see that happening in Libya, Gaddafi's you know, paramilitary were driving down a highway toward Benghazi. There were 100,000 people there. Uh, they were not armed as well as, as his forces were, and you could say they were going to be massacred. But if you took that seriously, what Western forces then had to do, bomb that highway, bomb those trucks and stop. That's not what they did. They bombed relentlessly for months, and it was clear that the objective was, in fact, regime change. And that's why, partly why the Russians and the Chinese are so furious, although Russia has a far bigger stake in Syria than it, than it would have had in Libya. And I think it would be doing much of what it's doing, regardless of what it be done. But when you use humanitarian language this way, and then you turn around and you see 30,000 dead in Syria and growing, 800,000 refugees, untold wounded, uh, you know, a hospital sector totally under stress, inadequate medical help by getting to the people who need it. It's very, very difficult for those same Western governments who stepped up using humanitarian language against Libya to explain to publics, why are we doing nothing? Uh, it was a misuse of R2P and responsibility to protect in Libya. At the same time, it's, it's hard for a country like the United States with uh, with its past and with its history and the, and the, the principles on which it is founded to solely use uh, uh, to solely use national interest as a reason for intervening in international affairs. They've always had, whether you agree with it or not, they've always had that values language uh, being part of their of their rationale. So they are caught between a bit of a rock and a hard place, if you will, in terms of, of intervening in Syria. But I, I agree with you. I don't see anything much more at this point other than supporting the rebels through armed shipments and perhaps, or not rebels, uh, the, the anti-Assad forces and perhaps a no-fly zone. Do you, do, you, do you, however, see Turkey getting more involved at this point and that perhaps 
uh, becoming a deciding factor in the Syrian crisis. Yeah, for the you know for the government of Turkey, this is a very very serious situation. Uh, first of all, uh, artillery shells are flying over their borders, and there's no government in the world uh, that when it, when it finds its territory is the object of fire uh, from outside forces doesn't react. Um, we may be in the in the digital age and the post state period, but my goodness, when when artillery shells fly over a state's border, leaders do what they've always done. They get really angry, and that's what you're seeing uh, with the Turkish government. Secondly, Syrian refugees are flowing across the border into Syria. There's a limit on how many the Turks can accommodate. Thirdly. Uh, it's the border area between Turkey and Syria that is the staging ground for most of the military um, equipment to flow the other way into Syria. So Tur you know, Turkey is being drawn into this war. And the fourth and the, I think the most threatening factor for Turkey is there are Kurds. Um, in, in Turkish areas there are Kurds, in the Syrian areas there are Kurds in northern Iraq, and there are Kurds in Iran. The Turks live in fear that their own Kurds will want to secede, will have it want an independent Kurdistan. We are already hearing that from some of the Kurds in Syria. So Turkey wants to shut this down as quickly as possible because it worries about its own territorial integrity. It is not going to wait around forever here. Janice, we're going to move on to uh, out of the Middle East, at least for now. There's a question here from Don M. And uh, it refers, it's referencing a program that we had last night uh, on the agenda having to do with um, um, how the world sees the American election, if you will, the world, uh, different, different countries and how their interests would be or would, would be affected by an Obama victory uh, or a Romney victory. And the question is following up on that. I'd love to hear Janice's uh, take on the U.S. presidential race. As one of the guests said last night, Barack Obama is, quote, Canada's president and the writer Don M completely agrees uh, and what does Janice think and I'm assuming the question is not do you think that Obama is Canada's president but uh, having to do more with uh, what, what is your view about um, how the presidency affects the relationship with Canada and whether uh, the relationship would change all that much whether there's a Obama is re-elected or whether Romney takes to, takes to the White House in January. So in terms of bilateral relationship between the two countries, Canada and the United States, I don't think it would change that much. If there's one area, there's two areas um, that are important to Canada right now uh, where we might see a change. Uh, one of the areas is always on trade issues. And Democratic presidents, even though your questioner says Obama's Canada's president, on trade issues, Democratic presidents always have to time. They have a tougher time in Congress because of who their supporters traditionally are. Uh, many of their supporters are more protectionist. Uh, that's not where we are in this country right now with respect to trade. And so we might have an easier time, paradoxically, on trade issues uh, were Romney elected. The second issue, I'm not sure there would be much of a difference. There's a difference in rhetoric. I don't think there'd be much difference in practice. It's the famous Keystone Pipeline, right. which um, you know the West in this country and others who benefit up the chain from the oil production that we sell want that pipeline built so we can export our oil south to the United States and not necessarily to stay in the United States but to be picked up in the Gulf of Mexico and move on. There is currently, as everybody knows, a glut of Canadian oil. We're selling at 25% below the international market price because we can't get our oil out of Canada in a really efficient and timely way. Uh, and Romney, I don't think, uh, would block that pipeline. But I don't think Obama's going to block that pipeline either. I think this was an election issue in Nebraska. When the election is over, I actually think that section of the pipeline is going to move ahead. The bigger picture is here and that our, ex our trade with the United States is dropping as a proportion of our overall trade. It, used, it, almost, it was 86 or 87%. It's down 
to the low 70s, and it's continuing to drop, partly as a result of the slump in the United States. It is still, by far, our biggest trading partner. will always remain so. And so we have to pay a huge amount of attention to the United States. But actually, our leaders are not focused much on the United States. They're focused on China, on India, on ASEAN, on Brazil, on Mexico, on developing new export markets for energy, for manufactured goods, because for the first time in this country's history, in, in the contemporary period, we realized the United States cannot be the only answer to Canada's economic future. It is actually quite interesting the degree to which Canada, after the signing of, of uh, the free trade agreement and then NAFTA in 93, kind of sat back on the international trade front and didn't pursue other uh, trade deals internationally, despite the fact that Canadians have become among the world's most ardent free traders. Uh, they, Canadians seem to be satisfied with the access, the guaranteed access to the American market. Uh, in retrospect, was that a bit of a mistake that we kind of lost 15 years of not uh, aggressively uh, looking for new export markets, especially in Asia? There's no question. Uh, and it's really a tragic mistake in a way, Don. You know, we were early in China. We came in, we had the Bethune legacy. Uh, I remember the Bank of Montreal being in China in the early 1990s. So we had an early entry. We didn't stay the course. We didn't pay attention. And our government has come late to the party. The whole world now is at Asia's door. But we are doing it. Um, you know, we are aggressively pursuing uh, the first free trade agreement with the European Union. This will be the first free trade agreement between the European Union and a developed country. So the United States is actually now watching what we're doing rather than the other way around. And some people are optimistic that we can get this done by the end of this calendar year, which would be terrific. Uh, we are pursuing bilateral free trade agreements in Asia. We are stepping up our performance in ASEAN. Uh, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which we've ignored for decades. And again, we were engaged in the early 90s and frankly let that slip. Um, we're much more engaged in India than we were before. Uh, we're looking hard at Brazil and at Mexico, which could be huge markets for Canada, and it's always easier to access than Asia. So we are really playing catch up. Uh, you know, world that is now focused uh, on, a, on the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, Janice, keeping it in North America, and more specifically with the American election, uh, Ashbox Live is asking, uh, would, should, would or should, President Obama replace Hillary, uh, and, in quote, and in brackets, and Bill, as Secretary of State, uh, understanding it's an election year, um, I think I know what you're going to say, um, but uh, go ahead. Should, uh, well, should it was a great twofer, as they say, <laughs> two for one, right? You got Hillary Clinton, but you also got uh, the Clinton Initiative and resources uh, of the Clinton Foundation. So this is a really good question. Uh, Hillary Clinton is leaving. Um, she's made the decision from everything I hear from everybody who knows anything in Washington. Uh, not you know the the official reason is she's tired and it is an exhausting job. She travels nonstop, uh, but there's a lot of speculation that this is not her last job and that she needs to distance herself uh, from the administration because she wants another crack at this in 2016. Who knows? Uh, but one of the interesting things about this election, regardless of who wins, we're going to have a new national security team. Uh, in the White House. There's a lot of rumors that Panetta, who's Secretary of Defense, he's so good at managing the relationship in Congress that they may move him uh, to one of the more central economics portfolio where they need his political smarts. Were that to be the case, Clinton would, um, Obama has to find a new Secretary of State, gets to find a new Secretary of Defense, Tom Donilon, who's his national security advisor, may move out of that job to something else. So everybody in the world is watching and speculating and gossiping about who, for whom the phone is going to ring uh, after 
November if Obama wins. Uh, just keeping it with Clinton, you said that she has to, you know, if, if, if uh, Hillary Clinton is interested potentially in a run uh, for the presidency in four years, um, does it surprise you that, uh, that Clinton stepped up yesterday and uh, took responsibility, as it were, for the attack on the, um, uh, in Benghazi that resulted in the death of the, uh, in, uh, of the American ambassador and three other Americans? Uh, obviously, you know, and if our, uh, our, our people who are participating don't know, it's become a bit of a political issue, more than a bit of a political issue in the United States because there has been some contradiction between the State Department and the White House on this. Uh, but she did step up yesterday. Was she just being a good soldier uh, in this case? He's certainly taking one for the president here. There's no question. Um, and, she, and she's doing it. Uh, I think her timing was really interesting as well. She does not want that to be the focus of the town hall this evening, that's coming this evening, because there can well be foreign policy questions uh, this evening in the town hall. But it's easier for her to do it now than Obama. If Obama does it, then uh, that gives wrong the ammunition to go at him this evening. If she does it by the time, if she runs, and who knows if she decides to run again, this will be long forgotten. This is not a major foreign policy disaster that she's going to own in, in any meaningful way. So relatively low cost to her. She shows herself yet again a loyal Democrat. Um, it's a good strategy on her part to do this. Uh, Janice, the next question is from Steve, and it's kind of a combination of the United States and bringing us back to the Mideast. And the question is, why does the United States not have more influence in Israel, or on Israel, I'm assuming, um, aid from the United States, uh, the, the, excuse me, Israel receives more foreign aid from the United States than any other country, um, yet the Israelis cannot even be persuaded to stop building illegal settlements. Seems to me like that would be a minimum requirement for getting the situation there, I'm assuming uh, the, uh, Steve means there being in Israel, among the Israelis and the Palestinians, more stable. What's your answer to that? It's all about coalition politics. Um, let me just backfill a little bit here and say that the government in Israel never enjoys a majority. No party ever gets a majority in Israel's parliament. You always need to build a coalition. And this prime minister, who is a right of center prime minister, heavily dependent on parties uh, that support settlements. Uh, so it is a core constituency in the bigger coalition. So no matter who on the outside pushes, uh, you're, what you're really asking the prime minister to do is to destroy his own government. And uh, no outside power has enough influence to make that happen. Uh, what really matters uh, to any Prime Minister of Israel, believe it or not, is not the aid that they get, because the Israeli economy is now vibrant enough and strong enough that that aid is much less important than it would have been even two decades ago. But what's really crucial is the implicit security guarantee that any Israeli Prime Minister depends on from the United States, and you're hearing it throughout the campaign. Uh, we will not allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon. We will protect Israel's security. So it's on those kinds of issues when a president of the United States really pushes hard on a fundamental security um, issue that you get the Prime Minister of Israel to move, but it has to be politically feasible. Many people argue Obama made a mistake by starting with settlements. He should have put a deal together which the Prime Minister could have sold to his own coalition and the broad middle uh, and allowed him to move on the settlement issue later rather than first when it was not clear that a deal would be forthcoming. But it's tough for any outsider, you know, in this country, when any President of the United States has ever told Canadians uh, what he thinks we should or should not do, the whole country stiffens its back and says, mix that of our business. We don't like it. And that's, it's no different there in the situation. No different here. Even Look more. when the president of France speaks up about Quebec, the kind of reaction that ripples through this country. So that's a, you know, that's a general pattern. People do not want to be told by foreign leaders what they need to do. So the, the, despite the fact that the, that the United States is a major, fi, fi, an, an, an enormous contributor to, uh, to uh, 
a provider of, Israel, of aid to Israel, it is not a simple causal relationship. That's right. That's right. And usually what's worked best uh, is when there's a good personal relationship between the two leaders uh, and an American president has been able to negotiate to, to, in a sense, draw Israel and one or the other parties, whether it's Palestinian leaders, Egyptian leaders, Jordanian leaders. Look, we just found out this week that the previous Prime Minister Olmert was in serious negotiations with uh, Syria uh, before uh, he, he lost, uh, you know, his government fell and then the, the civil war in Syria erupted. Uh, and there were, there were back-channel negotiations that were being led through the United States. It's that kind of power which is really affected. And, and, what we, and what we know is that there is a very poor relationship, at least that's what we're led to believe right now, between the Prime Minister of Israel and the current President of the United States. I think one would, you know, it, it's clear from all the reports of people who work, officials who work for both, that this is a, uh, this is a correct relationship, no warmth, no ease, um, no camaraderie of the kind that you might have seen, for instance, under Bill Clinton and Ehud Barak, uh, which is was very different in quality. Janice, we have about uh, time for about three more questions. So uh, Victor is actually taking us uh, to Pakistan, but it's a follow-up to something you said earlier, uh, where you we were talking about whether or not an Iranian, uh, the Iran would feel more adventurous uh, should it uh, become a nuclear power. And the question from Victor is. Did Pakistan become more interventionist and support insurgents when it developed nuclear weapons? Good that's question. A, you know, that's a, that's a great question because uh, when you look at the history of the India-Pakistan relationship, when, once both parties developed nuclear weapons, the possibility of all-out war between those two went way down. They came close. You know, famous encounter over Cargill. The United States intervened, warned them both that they were on the brink and how dangerous this was. They both backed down. They've never come close since. Oh, so when it became clear to Pakistan's leaders an all out military war was not a feasible option, they then moved to support, you know, militant activity, fundamentally focused on using attacks, bombs against civilians in, in Mumbai, in India cities, and they've been able to do that. And every time India has struggled with, do we retaliate with force, they're constrained to some degree because in the background are nuclear weapons. And that's exactly the argument that people make now with respect to Iran that should it have a nuclear weapon, it would in fact be able to act more like Pakistan, which is launch, um, support, encourage militant activities, and do so with much greater impunity because people would be reluctant to retaliate for that kind of activity against a nuclear power. Uh, having said that, I wonder if there's not a difference in that the Iranian state seems to, and government seems to be much stronger and has more control over its security forces than unfortunately the Pakistani state seems to have over its. Is that a consideration? I think that you're absolutely right about that. Um, you know, the ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence Services, which is that whole community uh, inside Pakistan, the intelligence agencies and the the armed forces are very powerful in Pakistan. There's been a history of repeated coups. Uh, so these are powerful institutional players uh, who often don't pay a lot of attention to what the civilian leadership says. That's one big difference with respect to Iran. Although there are militias, independent, you know, uh, the Bashij, the Revolutionary Guards, uh, that are also independent of formal structures in Iran. Uh, but are uh, responsible really to Khamenei. Uh, but the second big difference, and here's the more encouraging part of the picture, there is a bitter territorial conflict between Pakistan and India that has existed since 1948 over Kashmir. They're immediate neighbors, and so the conflict rears up uh, all the time. 
Iran is not in that same position. It does not have an immediate proximate territorial conflict with a neighbor of that order of magnitude. So the incentive to do it is also less. Okay, we a uh, couple more questions. Uh, Janice, this one's coming from Jeremy D. Uh, Dear Janice, I'm a second year international relations student and I was wondering if you think that broadly speaking, oh this is a big question Janice, I was wondering if you think that broadly speaking realism is more dominant than liberal theory as a strategic lens. Uh, it's, I think Janice what's happening here is that uh, Jeremy's writing a paper and he wants you to do his work for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if you think it's more dominant than liberal theory as a strategic lens, if so do you ever believe we will come to any sort of meaningful agreement on issues such as climate change or disarmament? So just to help our viewers along here, realism is an argument that we always act in our national interests. Politics is all about interests. Uh, whereas liberals will tell you that you can actually, there are common interests and shared welfare uh, is an important determinant of politics. You know, to make two very complex ways of thinking uh, simple. And so your questioner is asking if we're all about our national interest, will we ever come to agreements on something like the environment, which is a global commons issue, because no single state can fix the environment, no matter how much we do. Well, it is possible that we will because, uh, you know, one of the most interesting cases here is China. Uh, when the environmental discussions really got rolling internationally, what we heard back from the Chinese leadership over and over and over was, listen, you made this mess, you in the West, and that's true. You polluted the environment, you had industrial economies, it's our turn now. And you're trying to shut down our industrial growth uh, by enforcing some you know, sort of environmental standards. You do the heavy list lifting and let the emerging economies develop their economies before you ask us for that kind of sacrifice. Boy, what a change in China now. Uh, China is a leader for, in solar energy. It's a leader on solar panels. Uh, it is acting vigorously to control uh, emissions from its industrial base. So why are they doing that? They're doing that because they can visibly see the really adverse impacts that this is having on health in China. Uh, the lung diseases, uh, the, the, um, the costs in terms of uh, workers' health, uh, general health. And that's really happening. So the, the shift on environmental policy is, is happening because Chinese leaders see it's overwhelmingly now in China's national interest to do something about uh, environmental emissions and pollution. Janice, uh, we're going to end it off uh, with a question that brings it back to Syria, which is, I suppose, fitting given the situation, the awful situation that is uh, going on there. Uh, why wouldn't the partition of Syria be an option? And uh, the questioner is wondering if geography is, uh, is a reason why that is not being considered. You know, it's, it's all, partitions are awfully difficult to do. Uh, during the Iraq war, when the violence was fierce, many people talked about partitioning Iraq into three parts, a Sunni part, a Shia part, and a Kurdish part. Uh, boy, Iraqis did not like that idea. They did not like the idea of breaking up their country. They, were all, they, they preferred to fight over it um, and see, but they wanted to keep it whole. I think we would have very much that kind of conversation among Syrians too. You could see a partition, you know, an Arab, an Alawite district around Aleppo. Syrian Kurds create Kurdistan, which would drive the Iranians, the Iraqis, and the Turks crazy. Uh, but in Syria, it would be even more difficult because you have Christians, uh, you have so many overlapping Druze, so many overlapping minorities that uh, affecting a partition is really not an easy thing to do. It, it's interesting though, um, to, to turn that question to the developed world for a second. You know, we just read that the Scots have now reached an agreement with British government on a referendum. Uh, you're hearing a lot of this in Catalonia right now in Spain. Right. So where did, where's part so it, it's bubbling back up on the agenda and where is it most likely uh, it's interesting, it's more likely inside the European Union, where there are kind of supranational structures. So the Scottish leaders say, hey, don't worry too much. 
you know, we may be independent from Britain, but we're still going to be inside the EU and we're still going to be within Europe. Um, some of my students raised that yesterday with respect to Quebec. Um, is this question now coming back in different ways as we build these more supranational structures? Much less likely in, in the Middle East where there are none. More likely that you can rejig some boundaries now and then if you've got strong functioning supranational structures. What is the source of the Syrian national glue? And, and, and how do we know, given the, given the, the regime that's been there for, uh, since the 70s, the late 60s, early 70s, how do we know what it is that keeps Syrians together and, say, may want to reject partition, as you've just described it? You know, we don't really know, Dan. The source of Syrian national blue is, is in its colonial history because the French and the British drew these bloody boundaries everywhere in the Middle East, which have caused so much trouble. They did it in the 1920s. We're talking about boundaries more or less only 100 years old. Uh, but what, you know, we saw it in Iraq. It, was, it would have been easier to partition Iraq than it would be to partition Syria. And ultimately, that was not a solution that was acceptable to Iraqis. I suspect it would not be acceptable to Syrians either. With a tip of the hat to Mr. Sykes and Mr. Pico, that is Janice Stein. She is the director of the Monk Center for Global Affairs and TVO's own foreign analyst. And thank you very much for taking our viewers' questions, Janice. It's a pleasure. And that just leaves me to thank everybody for participating. Um, and don't forget to join us tonight. This evening we'll be having a live chat on the McGinty resignation to follow up on our live chat last night, 7.15 p.m. right here on TVO, uh, on the agenda.tvo.org. And uh, for the agenda, I'm Dan Dunsky. Thanks very much for taking part. Bye-bye.